important for this meeting of the Climate Change and Sustainability Committee held on the 14th of June 2023. I see that Councillor Allison is here. I have an apology from Councillor Anderson. Um, Councillor Frame is substituting for Councillor Anderson and I see that she's present at the meeting. We also have present Councillor Barker, Councillor Calicus. Just looking to see if Councillor Chalmers is here. Yes, I'm advised that uh, Councillor Chalmers is here. Councillor Clark is here. Um, Councillor Cooper has also joined the meeting. Councillor Dewar is here. Looking for Councillor Fagan. No, nothing from Councillor Fagan. Councillor Gowland. Yep, I see that Councillor Gowland has joined remotely. Councillor Hamilton is here. Um, Councillor Keat is also present. Councillor Lambie is present, as is Councillor Lockhart. Councillors Loudon and Mars are also here. Councillor McAdams. No, I don't see anything from Councillor McAdams. Councillor Leslie McDonald's here. Councillor McDougald is also present, as is Councillor McGeever. Councillor Nugent. I, I, I see that she's on, so that's that's good news. Councillor Razak is also joined. Councillor Rob is here. Councillor Ross is present, as is Councillor Scott. I have apologies from Councillor Thompson, and I'm just looking to see if Councillor Walker is here. And yes, um, I see Councillor Walker is here. My apologies, I'm looking for you online and you're on screen, not on screen. You're here, thank you. Um, there are also a number of officers present at the meeting, and with that, Chair, I'll hand back to you for the business. Thank you very much, Pauline. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the meeting. Uh, thanks for attending, and what is about the hottest day ever known to man. And uh, a special mention to all those who uh, men who are braver than me and are actually wearing a suit today. So, uh, congratulations, I salute you. Um, can I ask for any declarations of interest? And uh, not seeing any, so uh, move on to item two, the minutes of the previous meeting, pages three through six of your packs. Um, can I move that they are uh, a correct record? Thank you. Um, we'll now move on to items for decision. Uh, first up, item uh, three uh, from uh, pages seven through 16 of your packs, an update on the council motion, cut fuel bills, cut carbon emissions, kickstart the green economy. And I'm going to invite Jonathan Reid to speak to that. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, uh, members. The purpose of this report is to advise the committee um, of progress in relation to the motion. Um, it was approved by full council back on 7th of December 2022. The recommendations being that uh, the committee update um, on progress um, in, the, in the motion and also that um, the proposal to provide further updates in relation to the content um, be approved. Section 3 of the report provides background and summarises the content of the motion itself um, with the full version available for members in Appendix 1. Section four of the report provides an update on the actions progressed in response to date, um, and it's been compiled from colleagues across housing and technical resources and community enterprise resources. Members will note that uh, the detail has been provided in relation to the three aspects of the motion, um, 4.2, 4.3 and 4.4. And throughout these sections, uh, the report references where work is either already underway in particular points of the motion, or where the work is either aligning or in similar fashion to um, national outcomes or national plans or policies that are being progressed um, and we're awaiting further guidance or detail on um, in relation to the council's responsibilities for them. And finally, where perhaps it may not be appropriate for the council to progress um, on particular aspects of the motion at this stage, we've detailed these, the response and the reasons for these at the relevant sections within 4.2, 4.3 and 4.4. At 4.4 in particular, and we've noted that the final aspect of the motion in relation to kickstarting the local green economy, um, there's, there's no content in relation to that in this report, but as, as part of the recommendations, we're looking to bring back subsequent reports to the committee at a later date and where colleagues from economic development and employability services look to provide more information to members on how we can take forward actions contained within that particular part of the motion. Section five of the report um, looks for the, the next steps. And as I said, it's proposed that further reports be provided in progress in relation to all aspects of the motion. But given this aligns very closely with, with the wider agenda 
um, that take place in terms of energy efficiency and decarbonisation. Um, we're proposing that, that we'd also look to provide sort of wider updates as well in relation to some of the other aspects that the Council are taking forward. In terms of implications, Section 7 highlights the financial implications that may be um, as a result of the motion or service changes um, in, in our response to it. Um, and in particular, to draw members' attention to 7.2, um, where we've, we've highlighted that the, the current new build domestic programme for, for the Council and the retrofitting programme have been costed and accounted for um, within the, the housing revenue business account, the business plan. Um, any kind of enhancement to the specification within that or enhancement of acceleration of that uh, may require additional internal or external um, resourcing. In particular as well, it's 7.5 in that the, the time frame for meeting national net zero targets isn't achievable within the current levels of resourcing for the Council and that's something we've, we've highlighted in previous reports as well. So finally, I draw members' attention back to the recommendations at Section 2, um, where we are asking for progress within the initial update to be noted and that um, the proposal to bring future reports back to the area be approved. I'm happy to take any questions from committee members. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for that. Um, can I ask any members who would like to uh, speak to this to uh, indicate now if you're, uh, if you're uh, able to do so? Uh, and first I'll go to Russ Clark. Hey, thanks, Chair. Bear with me, my voice is going a wee bit uh, today. But I'd like to, to welcome the fact that we're getting this report. It's important we have updates on the, the motion and uh, what we're doing in, in light of it. Uh, although much of the, uh, the actions which are mentioned in it are all of stuff which we're already doing or it's already in plans or it's all about reviewing stuff or it relates to national uh, guidance or action. So going forward, it'll be useful to get further reports over if there's any more you know, new actions or a further acceleration of uh, of actions and reports which have been mentioned. But uh, thank you for the report. My, my question is, uh, it mentions the, a review of the residential design guide throughout the report. Uh, so I'd just like to ask when we should expect that to be completed and reported back. Thank you. Do you want to press your mic? Yeah, I'm going to, going to ask Tony to speak to that. Sorry, we're struggling to think which microphone it is on. <laughs> yeah, so, bear with us, we say, sorry. Yes. Are you using Kirsten's mic? Kirsten's. Okay. Yeah, right. Sorry. Actually, no. Right, sorry, th sorry for the confusion. Um, Councillor Clark, we're expecting to put um, a draft version of the residence design guide to committee, a planning committee, towards the end of this year. And after that, we'll consult on it uh, widely. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, go to Councillor Loudon. Thanks, Chair. Um, there's a certain irony in this question after what you were saying about how warm it is today, so apologies for that. Um, but my question was around section 4.2, where we're talking about um, the energy demand reduction plan having a set point of 18 degrees. Um, and understandably, given our usual weather um, in South Lanarkshire, it's talking about um, reducing heating times and boiler temperatures as well. Um, I'm sure all of us have been in here or in other council buildings where it's actually been cold because the air conditioning has been blasting. So um, actually the, the temperature must be sitting below 18 degrees because we're all scrabbling to find warmer things to put on. So just wondered if going forward when we're, this new plan is coming forward that's mentioned in 4.2, can we have a consideration of the the costs that are um, spent on air conditioning, so cooling as well as heating, and what the, the effect of that is and how we can look at making a reduction there. Thank you. Jonathan? Thanks, Councillor, for your question. Absolutely. Um, when we, we, we talk about heating, and, and quite often in, in these reports, particularly in relation to non-domestic, we're actually just talking about the sort of temperature of the, the building. So that does include where systems or combined systems offer the, the, the cooling element as well. So the school estate in particular, you'll have you know a, a unit that can do both and it'll try and keep it at a certain temperature uh, regardless of what the weather is outside. So we can absolutely um, be back to that when we're talking about that. In relation to our domestic estate, it's not something that we, we look to put into um, domestic properties, as you can understand. Being in, in Scotland, we don't tend to have a need for air conditioning at home, but 
the last three weeks or so is probably um, the, the outlier to that. But absolutely, in relation to the non-domestic estates, considered as part. Thank you for that. Um, Ralph Barker. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, there's one to two references in this first section to planning and in the next agenda items. And come back, I'd like to come back for planning in the, in the uh, later items. Um, perhaps uh, the main concern here, and I have a rhetorical question, um, is converting um, domestic premises, especially uh, you know, council um, sector, um, to non-fossil fuels, um, which mainly we come down to um, air source heat pumps, and across the UK, there's you know a real concern about you know the cost and practicality of it. What what I have found is, and my ward generally is not on the gas network, so a lot of houses depend on oil or council houses on electricity, and we had loads and loads of problems on conversion of some houses to air source heat pumps. In general. It was well received, um, and I just you know like to find out if if um, the committee in general has has, has found that um, tenants who complain to me repeatedly about attempts to make the electric system affordable suddenly found air source heat pumps quite good. Um, we did have a we did have a I mean the only real snag I've had with them was last November when we had that. Um, really, really cold spell, you know, unexpected cold spell, and some people's air source uh, heating failed. Uh, there was no backup to it, and then we got frozen pipes and houses flooding, so that's one thing to be concerned about. My main concern is when we come to convert or change from the gas system to air source heat pumps, that perhaps a lot of tenants and um, house owners might not be too happy, but I just wondered what the committee thought in general about the way forward with air source heat pumps, as that seems to be the only real option. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks very much for that, uh, Councillor Barker. I, I think you make a number of reasonable points there, um, and we obviously want to make sure that people who, who have their heating system changed uh, to the new, new air source heat pumps uh, are able to rely on it. Um, like you have had positive feedback overall, but certainly I'd want information on any uh, issues that arise so that we can we can try and help residents deal with it. And I'm sure uh, officials would be quite grateful for that as well. Um, I'm going to go to Kirsten Robb. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for all the work on this. I'm really pleased to see the new item of work, the, the plan to produce the energy plan by the end of 2023. Um, I think it's really important because council buildings make up 78% of the council's total carbon emissions and obviously it's a massive hit bill-wise to the council as well. So that'd be good to see that, that coming forward. Um, it was to ask as well as covering any financial savings if the energy demand reduction plan could project the carbon savings as well through that action as well so we can track it as part of the climate change action plan. Yeah. Um. Jonathan? Thanks, Councillor. Um, absolutely, yes, it's something we, we already do in terms of um, the carbon measuring um, in terms of the council's estate, and that's something, you know, if we're looking to, to model what might happen if we, we convert the buildings or change the temperatures within the buildings or make any other energy efficiency recommendations to those users of the buildings, then um, we'd look to, to hopefully see that happen within the, the carbon kind of monitoring or projections that we come forward with that as well. Uh, thanks for that. Um, Richard Lockhart. Um, Chair, just a question. I don't know. Um, do we have solar panels on the top of Almada Street, for instance? And if we don't, why not? Because during the day, they will produce the electricity, probably to run the air conditioning for nothing. And during um, the winter months, then at least you've got something coming in as well. But you know, if we're going to insist on everybody changing, perhaps we should start with Almada Street first. Thanks very much for that, Richard. Uh, I'm going to go back to Jonathan. Uh, for our... Joanne, sorry, apologies. There we go. 
Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Lockhart. Um, solar panels on the top of Omada Street's actually not technically the best solution for this building. Uh, we are currently looking to see what options there may be for ground source um, or for water source or for a district heating system for this building. Um, and we are in the second stages of a technical feasibility for that at the moment. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to go to Councillor Alex Allison. Just wondering, you're giving us a lot of figures there about emissions, etc. Do you ever look at the whole picture uh, and evaluate what other consequences there may be uh, in terms of um, the, the effect it has on carbon? An obvious example is changing your fuel from petrol and diesel to electricity obviously has a considerable benefit. But if you take in the whole picture, is it the same if you look at the production of the vehicles? For instance, the lithium required for the batteries, um, are you only looking at one aspect of all the different issues and simply ignoring other parts? I'm going to go to Jonathan Reid. Thanks, Councillor. Um, absolutely, we do. I think it's probably important to remember we're the, the end user. Um, of, of the, uh, a very long chain, I suppose, of, of where the electricity comes from. Um, but if we're electrifying heat, for example, um, that is something that we need to consider in terms of where that electricity is coming from. Otherwise, you're absolutely right. It's kind of absolutely pointless for us to be suggesting that we are, you know, cutting emissions when we're actually contributing to um, emissions being generated elsewhere. So it is something that's considered as part of all these different projects that look to, to decarbonise the council estate. Thanks very much for that. Um, I see no further questions, so I'm going to ask committee to agree the report. Thank you very much. Uh, move on to item number four, pages 17 through 52 in the agenda pack. It's the area-wide emissions route map, and I'm going to invite Gillian Simpson to speak to it. Gillian. Thanks, Chair. Morning, everyone. Um, so the purpose of this report is to present the outcomes from the consultancy work recently carried out by Ether Limited to establish a baseline position on South Lanarkshire area-wide emissions. Um, so this work was funded by the Climate Emergency Fund at a cost of £35,000 and involved environmental data analysis and interpretation and two stakeholder workshops, one internal workshop and one external workshop. Um, it was always intended that this work would lay the foundations and set the baseline for developing area-wide emissions route map. Um, it's by no means the answer at this stage, um, and while it does provide some high-level actions, um, it does not provide the detail to spe specifics um, on how we're actually going to reach net zero in South Lanarkshire. Um, the key messages from this report are summarised in Section 5, um, with the two biggest contributors to area-wide emissions being transport and domestic energy, and these each contribute 31% uh, contribute of the overall emissions in South Lanarkshire. Um, the next biggest contributor is agriculture at 18%. Um, although the Council has been doing some really great work um, to reduce its own carbon emissions, um, the proportion of the area-wide emissions that come from the Council's carbon footprint is actually just minimal at 2.5%. Nevertheless, the Council does have a significant influencing role to play and should continue to lead by example and take action internally to reduce its own emissions where possible, um, whilst obviously recognising the limitations with current financial and resourcing constraints. Um, however, focus should now be given to engaging more with external stakeholders um, to work together at reducing the area-wide emissions um, and also in considering offsetting opportunities within South Lanarkshire, um, given the potential for carbon absorption through our peatland and forestry resources. Um, and a lot more work is required in this area to better understand um, South Lanarkshire's potential for offsetting. Um, we already know that the scale of action required for area-wide emissions reduction is extensive and the time frame for meeting national net zero targets is ambitious. Um, in fact, if we just continue with business as usual and we don't take any significant behaviour change or technological innovation, and then it is unlikely that the net zero targets set by Scottish Government will be met. Even with the best case tailwind scenario as outlined in the Ether report, um, there will still be residual emissions in 2045, and that's where offsetting um, emissions um, becomes necessary to reach the net zero in the South Lanarkshire area. Um, just one technical issue to point out with the report, um, just a wee typo in Appendix 1 on page 21 of the papers. Um, East, Kilbride, um, East Kilbride Housing Association is down as both attending and not attending, but I can confirm they did attend um, the workshop, um, this external stakeholder workshop. So just we'll get the report updated to confirm that. 
Um, in terms of recommendations, um, we're asking committee to note the progress that we've made on establishing the baseline position with our area-wide carbon emissions and to agree the next steps as outlined in section 6.1. And those proposed next steps are to do some more work to agree to how to engage with external stakeholders and involve them in area-wide emissions reduction, um, to work with these stakeholders to set targets for area-wide emissions reduction, um, and consider how we can link area-wide emissions reduction with other key council strategies, policies and plans, um, for example, the Net Zero Town Centre project work that's underway at the moment. Um, and importantly, um, in doing all of this, we want to ensure that due consideration is given to climate justice and ensuring that any transition to net zero does not exasperate poverty or inequalities. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much for that, Gillian. Um, and I think it's very worthwhile for everybody to know um, the uh, organisations, the external stakeholders who have engaged so far, and we'd like to encourage and invite others to continue to do so in future and uh, take any opportunity. And I'm sure we'll work with them in any way that we can. Um, it's worth pointing out that South Lanarkshire, as you've done, Council's uh, emissions are only 2.5% of South Lanarkshire as a total, but obviously we can and should play a leadership role, and I'm delighted that we're doing so. Um, can I ask anyone who would like to speak on this item to indicate uh, their wish to do so now? Uh, thank you very much. And I'll go to Councillor Clark first. Yeah, thanks, Chair, and thank you for that report. It's useful that we have this uh, information and uh, these recommendations as well in, in the reports. Uh, I've got a couple or a couple areas in which I've got questions, so I'll, I'll bring in the first couple and then I'll uh, come back in. Uh, how do we plan to review our progress against the recommendations in the, the route map? Should we expect you know, a future report on it and the, the recommendations which have been mentioned? Uh, and do we plan to continue engaging with EFA? Uh, I notice in the report it says they're happy to provide further advice on things. It ne doesn't necessarily need to be another piece of work, but I know they've said they're, they are also happy to uh, engage. Thank you. I'm going to go to Gillian. Thanks for that, Ross. Thanks, Councillor, for your question. Um, so, yeah, this report is just the first stage in understanding or our, our, our monitoring our, our, our area-wide emissions. Um, it sets the baseline, as, as I mentioned. Um, but the data that gathered from that will be incorporated in our public sector climate change duties report. That's an annual report that we need to um, publish for Scottish Government, and it will come back to this committee in November for approval before it's then submitted to the Scottish Government. Um, in terms of the recommendations outlined in the report, um, if approved today, we'll be looking to identify the relevant stakeholders and discuss the overall feasibility of the recommendations. Um, and then we will incorporate those actions that we identify and agree on um, within the future reporting of the climate change strategy through the normal sort of reporting to, to, via this committee um, using the improved system. So it will be included within the next iteration of the Sustainable Development Climate Change Strategy Action Plan. Um, in terms of Ether, um, yes, we've got a good relationship with Ether. Um, we have they have confirmed that they're happy to assist with any further queries or comments on this piece of work. Um, in fact, we've got a couple of queries um, outstanding with them at the moment that we're going back with. Um, however, this piece of work was funded through the Climate Emergency Fund. Um, and at this stage, there is no further funding funding aligned for any future um, projects with either at this stage. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I've got a couple of other questions. That's, yeah, that's uh, okay. Thank you for that uh, answer. And uh, just a, a technical one, first of all, uh, you might have noticed on, on page 21 in the or the engagement event it mentions East Kilbride Housing Association as having both attended uh, the stakeholder engagement as well as having been invited but did not attend. So just to uh, flag that. And then just generally on uh, EV charging, I know that's uh, mentioned. Uh, also with the, the introduction of charges and the, the changes in them have it's, have we seen that to have an effect on the, the uptake or the you know the number of s charging sessions uh, and as well in relation to leveling up uh, do we have any more details about the next round of the, the leveling up funding if we plan to put in a similar sort of bid in relation to, to EV charging and the other uh, bids as well thank you Thanks very much for that, Ross. I'm going to ask Colin Park to take the first part of the question, then Alison the second, if that's okay. Uh, Colin? Thanks, Chair. Hopefully you can all hear me now. Uh, I'm just kind of picking up in Councillor 
Clark's question there. So uh, in terms of demand, we introduced uh, tariffs in November last year. We went to committee in August to uh, full exec committee uh, to establish the principle of introducing the tariffs. Since then, we're seeing on, on average uh, a reduction of around about 50% in the usage and the demand at these sites. Uh, now, that might seem initially alarmist. However, I would highlight that what that is doing is providing the wider capacity for others to make that switch. And uh, some of you have probably heard me saying this before. A close friend of mine, let's just say, drives a nice big luxury car. Uh, and he's now charging at home because he can, as opposed to using the free electricity that was being provided by the council. Uh, so what that is doing now is he's charging at more appropriate location. He obviously made that switch to a vehicle a good number of years ago. He's now not no longer driving an electric car. He's now charging at a more sustainable location. A more, a more convenient location for him as well. So we're seeing that across across the kind of patch. Uh, the tariffs that were that we've introduced is uh, providing us a more sustainable infrastructure uh, system now. Uh, I think you might be remember back in August we reported that we were potentially heading for a almost the cost of a million unbudgeted cost. Uh, we've now reversed that. We're now running the cost uh, as contributing to some of the kind of the kind of wider pressures to the council at a very modest level, I would say. Uh, this is not uh, a significant income generator for us. And we're also been able to put a modest amount into a sink fund, a sink, sinking fund, which will allow us to enhance and hopefully replace the network over the next four or five years. Uh, continuing to look at all sources of funding to expand and extend it. Uh, but it's now a sustainable solution that the council has. So that answers your, your, your question, Councillor Clark. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks for that. Uh, and uh, Alison Brown is going to pick up there, I think. Alison. Thank you. In relation to your point around Luff, round three of the UK Leveling Up Fund was meant to be announced in spring this year. That hasn't happened. My understanding is that it may well be announced before the summer recess at Westminster, middle of July. Um, so we, we wait to hear um, what the criteria is around the round three. Certainly, um, if there is an opportunity to revisit previous submissions, we will do so. Um, but at the moment, um, the only confirmed um, information we have around round three is that any expenditure must be um, spent by March 2025. So we wait for further information and I'm sure we'll come back to you in due course. Thank you for those answers. Thank you very much. Uh, we get, with regards to levelling up funding, can I just say that obviously there was huge disappointment about the, the failure of an excellent bid submitted previously, and we can only hope that the, the UK government um, would look upon uh, a further resubmission of that favourably, as we all think it should. Um, with that, can I go to Councillor Ralph Barker? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, can I make a comment? If anybody can uh, answer... Uh, possibly, possibly, Colin, uh, be grateful. Um, the largest, the you know, the biggest source of emissions, um, both in Scotland and across the UK, is transport. Um, we've heard the environmental costs of, of um, electric vehicles. Um, not really con said too much about the actual financial cost, and it seems difficult to think that EVs will be affordable for general use uh, in the way that cars are now. Um, what, uh, and so, you know, to that, you know, to that extent, government is talking about a reduction in the amount of road traffic, 20%. Um, been hearing this for 30 years. Um, what it comes down to is we'll never get to net zero without an expanded electric rail network. Um, that is the only way we're really going to make a difference. Um, and now across areas of South Lanarkshire, um, there are whole areas with a very poor access to the rail network. Um, I don't know if anybody can remember when there was the last a railway station opened um, in South Lanarkshire. Lark Hall. Well, sorry? Lark Hall. Well, and that is 20 <laughs> years now, 25 years. 20 years. And that was... Uh, a massive campaign, uh, which yes. which we won, and nobody would think of closing that now. Sorry, I didn't want to be diverted down to that call, uh, but that is you know a prime example. So what we have had 
uh, particularly Clydesdale, is appraisal after appraisal after appraisal. And it seems the result of these appraisals is, well, you know, another appraisal. Um, so we've been getting we've been getting nowhere on that. But it's not just it's not just the, the semi-rural area of Clydesdale. Um, at one stage many years ago, uh, a councillor for East Kilbride said, I don't know what you're complaining about, um, railway stations. We've got a good train service in East Kilbride. I would say East Kilbride has a train service. But, I mean, it's still relatively limited. I mean, you know, the amount of traffic between East Kilbride and Hamilton, you know, is massive. And it's not by, it's, it's not by rail. Proposals to electrify to East Kilbride going ahead, but not on the scale that was envisaged. The cost was cut, so it still won't be double tracked, for instance. And just in case anybody mentions that word metro, which is coming from SPT at the moment, uh, need to explain how metro will help Straven or Les Mahago. So any, any answers to that, I'd be very grateful for. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Councillor Barker. Uh, I'm going to go to Colin. Yeah. Colin Park. Councillor Barker, for, for those questions. Uh, I think there were some questions in there. Uh, in terms of Clydesdale, uh, I'm sure Councillor Barker can appreciate this comment. You know, the, the wheels of infrastructure in the rail industry don't turn very quickly. Uh, and it is a little bit frustrating, I'm sure, Councillors who have been engaged through the kind of stag process over, over the last many years, three, four years, will uh, will appreciate that. You know, we have identified and it's been shared a whole range of interventions in, in, in the Clydesdale area, uh, some of which are maybe more deliverable than others in the short term. Uh, we have identified new stations to you know in that area as well that will come forward uh, as and when that case can be made stronger as well. We all know post COVID. Uh, pressures on all public transport, both bus and rail, uh, has seen demand reduce. It's beginning to recover to a certain extent. And some of the work that had been done previously in the Clydesdale area, given the dispersed demand across the rural area, uh, let's just be honest about it, it, it didn't justify or make the case for new stations. That said, we shouldn't be just accepting that and just saying, right, you know what, we're never going to get one. So through the STAG assessment, which is a Scottish government-led appraisal process, which we must follow, we have still got these stations in there. They're, they are still there to be progressed. There's obviously other discussions ongoing, you know, wider, you know, chat a good, a good number of months, months ago about opportunities to, to review, you know, further extension of the rail network into Clyde, to Clydesdale. So we... We, the council, don't run rail services. We don't deliver rail infrastructure. We don't deliver stations, whatever. But what we do do is we've got a, a we've got a lobbying role, and what we are trying to do is to, to provide us and have evidence that we can, as we did via the strategic transport projects review, make the case uh, as much as we could for inve investment through the council's local transport strategy, which is uh, currently the conversion of 2013 to 2023, obviously it ends this, this year. Work has now commenced on looking at that 10-year investment strategy for the council and embedded in that will be some of the kind of the points that you've talk, talked about there, Councillor Barker, in particular for the for the Clydesdale area. Just briefly on here, Myers, I think that's probably the only point. Uh, I think we all know the, the background to where we are with kind of the, the East Kilbride line, your know, upgrade of a, a new station at the at the village uh, and a relocated station at here, Myers. We're progressing just in the last week or so. Uh, there have been publicity around a, a consultation event we're doing towards the end of June. The council are doing for our element of the project in terms of the park and ride. Uh, and we expect uh, further announcements, hopefully positive, coming forward from Transport Scotland and Network Rail in, in relation to their programme. But what we need to do is to progress with the consultation now. So when the ambitious programme is coming forward from Net Network Rail and Transport Scotland, uh, does come forward, we are ready to, to go and deliver our element of it. So Councillor Barker, hopefully I've covered some of those points. If I haven't, we're happy to kind of take, take some follow-up if need be. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to go. Thanks very much for that, Colin. I'm just going to go to Lindsay Hamilton, who's asked to come in. 
Thanks, thanks, Chair, for letting me come in on on that point, specifically on Clydesdale Stag. I think of, um, I think the councillors are, are maybe doing an update on where Clydesdale Stag is is going because we've not had an update in um, in quite a long time. Um, and quite frankly, our constituents are still waiting for. Uh, there were some good ideas in that, and I understand that we don't have a transport role, but we do have a lobbying role um, in that. And my constituents are continuously asking me what's happening with Law Train Station, what's happening with the the buses in Law, etc. And there's a campaign there if if there needs to be a campaign because people, quite frankly, need transport in the village. Um, and I know Law Train Station is is is, is a long way away, but there is other things that can be done to improve the transport in the village so that people people can um, move about a, a growing a growing area. Um, so I, I would appreciate. Um, I think I have emailed Colin, but I would appreciate if we ha if the councillors in Clydesdale could have an update meeting on what what is um, happening with with the area. Um, also look forward to the new transport secretary being um, from Clydesdale. So Law and Simonton Station being right up there on the um, on their priorities. Thanks. Thanks very much for that. Uh, Colin, do you want to come back in there? Or yeah, you? just very briefly on the back of Council, Councillor Hampton's point. Yeah, uh, Councillor Hampton has written to me and you know, we are preparing a short update. Uh, it has been a particularly busy period. Lots of priorities coming forward. The key thing for us is to is to is we are not sitting with a pot of money to allow investment in areas that have been identified either the short, medium or long long term. How we get that funding is to build it into a strategy document, allow us to bid to either to SBT, to bid to you know national government, to bid to any other pot of money that we can find. So you know that's where the focus has been. I appreciate Councillor Hampton's point, uh, maybe a long overdue an update, so we'll get that coming coming out Thank shortly. You. Thanks, Thank Jill. you very much for that. Um, can I just add uh, as well to um, a broad agreement with everything that's been said so far and the fact is that even if you look within the urban areas of South Lanarkshire, we are not particularly well connected at times to other parts of the city region. Um, and I've heard from a number of uh, nurses and doctors who cannot use public transport to get into work for the start of their shifts, and that's in Glasgow city centre. So if even between the major population centres we were falling down there, then and that's something I think the central government at, at both levels really has to engage with the local authorities uh, on, a, on a continuous basis to try and go further than we have today and, and get more done. Um, can I go to Kirsten Robb? Thank you. Um, this is a really important piece of work. I went along to, I think, at least one of the workshops. And I think to get that level of engagement from the range of people we did was, was really good. Um, and it's about continuing those conversations and building on that the good work that came out of that so just to find out a bit more about what the next steps are to continue and build on that uh, and the second point is that um, the Ether report clearly said that we need to prioritise action on the biggest emitters which are transport and domestic energy um, the council doubt now does have powers to run their own public transport because we've seen the challenges of trying to get the private sector to join up provision um, is this something that the council are considering, working with neighbouring authorities to start looking at some of the other solutions that could be possible to improve public transport? Uh, thanks, Kirsten. David Booth would like to come in. David? Uh, th thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Rob. Um, just in terms of the um, of running the council, running its own public transport, um, it is an area that... Um, Again, we've had some initial discussions on, but um, but, the, but but it's not something that we've advanced at any particular stage as yet, but it is something that um, we've been getting to, to, to take an interest in. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Walker. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> just following on from, from some of these points, um, I think in terms of um, EV and the charging infrastructure, I think there needs to be a far more um, national approach. There should be a national planning strategy um, to improve the charging infrastructure, and that means investing in it. Um, I mean, across Europe, I think we're one of the countries that, you know, invest much less and leave it to, you know, car manufacturers, the private sector. When you think of the, you know, the catastrophe that's facing us down the line and transport is, you know, one of the major, major drivers of it, um, then there should be, if you like, a kind of, you know, wartime approach in terms of getting these infrastructures 
set up so that people can actually, you know, use electric cars and also, you know, help to, to bring the price of them down. Um, they're also, in, you know, in, in certain areas, depending where you live, very, very difficult to use some of the chargers and, and they don't work a lot at the time. So there needs to be a far more, you know, a national subsidised, better approach to this. I mean, levelling up is fine, but in, in terms of the, the magnitude of the issue that we're dealing with, you know, we shouldn't be dependent on bidding um, to, to improve our EV infrastructure. I mean, it should be taken as read that we have to get to a certain point by a certain time, if we wouldn't have any chance um, of not sitting here in 10 years and 110 degrees, um, which is, you know, is bad enough just now. And also in terms of the public, the, the buses and the transport issue, absolutely, um, we should run um, our own, um, you know, public transport service. But again, it comes down to, you know, local authorities being underfunded to the degree that they've been underfunded for the past 12 years, it's extremely difficult to do that. You cannot do that um, at, at no cost. But that is absolutely, you know, what we need. Um, and there should be a national plan, a national strategy that takes in the buses and the rail um, to give us any chance um, of meeting the targets that, that we need to meet. Um, and that's sometimes what I sometimes find you know, frustrating about that this whole debate um, is that we are, to some extent, going about it. Um, in a piecemeal fashion, and we shouldn't be. I mean, I think under the circumstances, South Lanarkshire has did great work. I'm, I'm not um, criticising that, but we're not supported to do it. We're not supported by a national drive um, to actually achieving this um, and getting people off the road with their cars. And until we are, um, I'm afraid we're going to be, you know, trailing behind in a lot of those targets. So that, that's really just an observation. I wasn't expecting a response. Thank you. Thanks very much, and here, here. Uh, I'm going to go to Colin anyway because he's indicated he'd like to say something. So, uh, Colin Park. Today, I've got to join uh, on Conferro today because I probably won't get asked many questions. So, clearly, that didn't that didn't pan out. So, uh, I think Councillor Walker's made some some uh, very good points there, and I give a degree of comfort on both both fronts in terms of the EV infrastructure and the wider strategy across Scotland. Uh, I actually chair on behalf of this kind of city region, a senior officers group, uh, looking at how we can expand, uh, roll out uh, wider, more significant infrastructure across the city region, recognising you know, the kind of various geographical differences, in particular in South Lanarkshire, where it's a bit more challenging, albeit I do kind of share Councillor Walker's points, you know, some of the work that we did over the last couple of years through the PACE project has seen our you know, network, uh, I think we're close to certainly doubling, a bit kind of more than more than doubling. So what we have just now is what we need at this moment. But if that, you know, kind of 2025, 2030 target uh, comes round, uh, sorry, will come round, we obviously need a, a lot more. It's a significant piece of work that's just concluded. Uh, consultants, Mark McDonald, have done a strategy for the city region, uh, looking at what we need. Uh, and there's also a piece of work, uh, kind of parallel piece of work ongoing as we speak, uh, looking at how that can be delivered, uh, looking at a number of options ranging from completely private sector uh, running with it, basically saying, go ahead, you know, here's here's what we need, what can you, do you deliver, uh, and going to the other extreme is the council themselves either directly doing what we're doing now or perhaps you know developing into more of a, an arm's length company to run it. Uh, I've actually engaged with the market just in the, in the last couple of weeks and it's actually quite exciting out there what they have and their ability to provide the finance for them to deliver it. Uh, not entirely, you're not totally privatising that whole thing, but maybe you're kind of looking through these kind of cost share arrangements and income generators, etc. as well. So there is a fair bit of work uh, coming forward, Councillor Walker, and I'm sure Alison Brown's probably chuckling there because there was actually meant to be a paper coming to today's committee on EV infrastructure and the strategy and how we're going to ex expand it, but I'm afraid it just kind of slipped slipped from this agenda into the potentially the next next one, if not the next one, the one after that. So uh, in terms of the kind of public transport, Councillor Walker as well, uh, we're also engaged with the city region, the SBT, uh, you know, public transport doesn't just stop at South Lanarkshire boundaries, so there's a need for a maybe more wider set city region approach. Uh, but the pressures on local government just now in terms of finance, you know, if the bus companies are finding it challenging to run buses, uh, and they're pretty good at it, 
Uh, we also find it a bit challenging. So uh, there's a lot of discussions ongoing. We all recognise the pressures that are, uh, are in front of us. Uh, but there is a fair bit of work ongoing just now. We don't have all the answers, but we are heading in the right direction. Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much, Colin. Um, I'm go I was going to finish there, but I'm going to go to Councillor Barker with my apologies, Ralph, because I think you wanted the supplementary earlier and it uh, didn't catch my eye, so that's on me uh, if you want to come in there. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just in case anybody thought my uh, tirade about transport appraisal after transport appraisal was a criticism of uh, our council, um, the appraisals are Scotland appraisals and they actually seem designed to fail. Colin Park has been on this for years, if not decades. And you know, I could forgive him for not having enthusiasm for starting another uh, another appraisal. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah, we, we certainly all, it's worth point, a point that we all appreciate the work that's uh, going on uh, continuously by our, our officers at the council. And uh, I would hate to think that they, anyone was under the impression to the contrary. So thanks for making that point. Can I ask the committee to agree the report? Thank you. And now we move on to items for noting. It's the only one. Um, we take you to page 53 of your packs, the role of planning and building standards. I'm going to invite Fraser Carlin to speak. So, Fraser. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, this report here is um, it's about recent changes to building regulations that have been introduced, as well as the, the new national planning framework, which was approved by Scottish Parliament earlier this year. Uh, it's now part of the development plan, so it needs to be taken into consideration with all planning applications. Section four of the report, it sets out the changes to the building regulations, and they, they seek to improve the, you know, the fabric, the efficiency, the performance of new buildings. And as you will see, it sets new targets for reductions in emissions, for improved insulation, as well as a requirement for vehicle charging. All of these uses, I think it goes without saying, will have implications in relation to the cost of construction. Uh, but it's in this context that the, 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 the introduction is being phased. Uh, it's also noted that along with new regulations, these will be brought forward uh, and they're, 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 they are within the context of the, the Scottish Government's programme. Uh, section 5, beyond this, the, the outlines the information that is covered by the, the National Planning Framework. As I say, it was approved by the Scottish Government in February 23, and it sets the high-level outcomes that the Scottish Government want to achieve through a national spatial strategy. The MPF promotes overarching principles to achieve net zero and to adopt to climate change challenges. And to this end, uh, it promotes 33 policies against which all development must now be assessed. Some of these policies introduce um, new issues that uh, are new to planning authorities. And we're awaiting guidance on matters such as community wealth building, health wellbeing, uh, and also to some extent how we will measure the impact of development in terms of the principles of net zero. But on the whole, though, the National Planning Framework complies with our own local development plan and is used in the decisions that are taken on all planning applications by the Council. Section 6, though, it sets out the process that we're now embarking on in terms of pre preparing the next iteration of the local development plan for South Lanarkshire. We will be seeking formal approval to start this process at the Planning Committee later this year. And this will provide an opportunity to, uh, to further reflect the principles and the policies in the National Planning Framework and to put them into context for, for South Lanarkshire as well. Uh, there will be significant engagement, consultation in the preparation of the local development plan. And this will involve all elected members as well as all aspects of the community, the population, all ages. Uh, it's a significant process that we go through with a view to producing a, a local development plan in, in due course that meets the needs of our environment, meets the needs of our communities, but also looks to you know, promote growth within South Lanarkshire as well. So in summary, I hope this paper is uh, it's, it's a helpful summary of the, uh, for the Climate Change and Sustainability Committee about the, the changes that are coming through with the building regs as well as with the planning policy position. We will look to provide regular updates to the committee as new regulation and policies are brought forward, but happy to take any questions just now. Thanks very much for that. Uh, Fraser, can I ask any members who would like to comment to indicate uh, their desire to do so now? Uh, first off, can I go to Councillor Barker? All right, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Fraser. Um, can't emphasise more the importance of the, the new national planning framework for, uh, to some extent, it resurrects the, the, the previous Scottish planning guidance 
which was considerably weakened by the Scottish Government. So it's very welcome and it will make a big difference, especially to a rural area and, you know, quite quite a shock in, you know, the, the last um, planning committee um, when the NP4 has been, has been applied, um, particularly is going to make it difficult for anybody to build expensive housing out in the in the greenfield, basically for people who have no real connection with the with the rural area. And now this has been going on for years. Um, I mean, 30, 30 years. I remember the former Clydesdale um, head of planning um, criticising. Uh, criticising you know, people moving out into the rural area just because they want to live in the rural area and have no connection with it. So there were big changes. Um, I think there is a snag in the changeover. Um, plenty of applications made before NPF4 actually came into force. Um, we'll have to get through that. One of the things that I understood uh, from mm -hmm. Fraser, and I would ask if he, if he could just um, uh, clarify it slightly, and that is... NPF4 is much better for the environment, but there's just a suggestion that enforcement will be weakened. I wonder if Fraser could just clarify that for me, please. Thanks. Fraser? Yeah, no, thanks, Councillor. Yeah, no, the, I don't see any reason why enforcement should be weakened around this. In terms of the, you know, the NPF4, as I, as I mentioned there in my summary, you know, it, it does comply with the vast amount of policies that we have within the LDP. Uh, as the LDP looks forward, we'll need to reflect that in terms of the national planning framework, wider ob objectives and principles. Certainly enforcement is just a matter that we need to make sure that if we're, we're guiding development to the correct places, it's good quality development that we want to have in the right places so that um, people are able to get access to services so that the, the impact in terms of the, the environment, traffic generation is, is minimised. Um, enforcement is a matter that would sit with us as, as the planning authority. Um, we would look to make sure that development is approved, uh, that the conditions are complied with as we move forward. It always can be a challenge um, because there are issues that we need to go through courts and that there can be legal action that can take say, a considerable period of time with enforcement. But the, I wouldn't necessarily see any you know, like suggestion that the MPF4 would, would, would weaken our enforcement activity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Kirsten Rock. Thank you. Um, big fan of NPF4. I think it's about create back to proper holistic planning where you create places where people can thrive, um, not just commuter settlements. Um, so the question is, um, more, in the Ether, Ether report previously on page 49, it highlighted the importance of enforcing performance standards of buildings seen as domestic energy as one of our biggest emitters as well. Um, how will, or how are we assessing that uh, developers, particularly private developers, are demonstrating compliance with the new uh, building regulations um, because there's some evidence to suggest that some previous private developers weren't meeting energy standards when uh, they've gone post-build post -build assessments. Thanks. Thank you for that. Uh, Fraser? Yeah, uh, thanks, Councillor. Yeah, no, I, I, to some extent, in terms of measuring performance from new development, is something we're waiting on for their guidance on. Uh, th that, this is where I think it's quite important, tying in with, with building regulations as well as planning policy. Building regulations give us very black and white factors that you can measure against in terms of it as a standard that is applied across the rest of the country. The planning policy position tends to sit with the place and with the area, so you, you would you'd probably need to take a more holistic view in terms of the impact that that has in terms of trip generation, the, the, the sort of carbon creation and the like as well, and the sort of the, and the, the positive impacts that comes from a wider development. But there are different, um, probably you know, pieces of software, different bits of intelligence that we would look to implement so that we can measure the overall performance of our plans as we move forward. But I, I, I would say at this stage, it's, um, we're moving into a, a kind of different way of working. Um, and we await further guidance. For them. What I think we have to be careful of is we don't set a system up in, North, in sort of South Lanarkshire, which is 
different from what's happening across the rest of the country or actually means that, you know, the Southland should become a less attractive place to develop. We want to make sure we have the framework in place that allows development to thrive, that we got all the positive benefits that can come from that policy framework of MPF4. Uh, but at the same time as well, we want to make sure that we do have a system that can be measured that doesn't then have an impact on, you know, that, that doesn't stop development, I suppose, as well. So it's a wait and see, uh, and, I, and I welcome your positive comments in terms of the MPF4 as well. And we will then need to reflect that through our engagement and consultation and delivery of the, the local development plan. Thank you very much. I'm going to take a final question from Councillor Leslie MacDonald. Thanks, Chair. Question for, for Fraser, please. Um, MPF4 has been causing quite a lot of controversy, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, have, can you advise me, you don't know this, but have all the planning applications that were submitted pre-February this year, uh, have they all, all been dealt with through planning? Or do we still have, uh, you know, I'm aware of the amount that's coming through planning, so um, I just wondered if they'd all been dealt with. Thank you. Thanks for that, Fraser. No, uh, thanks, Councillor. No, they haven't all been processed as yet. There, there are a number of reasons with that. Sometimes we've gone back to applicants, asking them for further information, which might not necessarily have any relation to its, its assessment through national planning framework. So it can be, um, so it can be any manner of technical question. We have a number of applications as well, which actually are subject to Section seventy five agreements being signed off. So they will need to come back, but again, they won't be impacted by the, the, the national planning framework. Um, we are working through the legacy of. Case Cases. Um, and we, in terms of the, the applications that did sit before the approval MPF, we have written out to all agents and said, how do you now want to you know, the, the, the effectively provide as a description of your proposal within the context of MPF4? Uh, we will look to work through these in due course. Um, and you know, we, we do want to, we did have quite a long legacy of applications that hadn't been dealt with. Uh, and once we clear that out, I think it will leave us in a clearer position in terms of the, the straightforward policy framework that we're working to. The one thing I would mention is the, the, the way that South Lanarkshire is applying national planning framework for is the same across the country. Uh, I've been reviewing you know, planning committees across other council services and where we have a similar policy context, yes, the, 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 the same national planning framework is being applied. So we're not out of kilter with others, but we'll look to work through that you know, backlog as quickly as we can. Uh, and that will then be, you know, and the, the policies that we then come forward through the local development plan will then reflect the national planning framework as well. Thanks very much. Uh, with that, councillors, can I ask that uh, the committee agrees to note this report? Thank you very much. Uh, I have no urgent business, uh, so with that, I'd just like to thank everyone, elected the members, members in, the, in the committee room and at home, as well as all the officials in the room and at home for uh, their participation today. It is greatly appreciated. And if I could just take the opportunity to say to our officials that uh, we do very much value uh, your input and the response to members' questions uh, and your advice. It is greatly appreciated. So thank you very much. And with that, I'll bring the meeting to a conclusion. Thanks all.